Welcome to this video on special relativity. Now, unlike other videos, this one is purely exam based. And so I thought one of the best ways to teach special relativity is to jump in at the exam level. So I would first of all like to acknowledge VCAA for their papers. And I've used the papers from the 2017 to 2019 study design. Before we get into some exam questions, I highly recommend the following resources. These are two of the um, YouTube channels that I really enjoy, and I think you get a lot out of them as well. First one is Minute Physics. They've got a lovely series on special relativity, a sequence of uh, short video clips, uh, which goes into some of the physics of special relativity. Now, as always, Derek from Veritasium, I love his work as well. He's got some great examples here. Quite often, they're really good ways to start a topic, to get in there and have a bit of a think, to get the mind ticking over. And he's got one episode on Can You Go the Speed of Light, which starts to introduce the idea of special relativity. He also has some information there on where does the sun get its energy from, and that's really, really good when we're looking at the nuclear fusion process involving the sun, which is also on the VCAA study design. At the heart of this topic, that being special relativity, we have Einstein's postulates. The first is, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial, that is, non-accelerated, frames of reference. Number two, the speed of light has a constant value for all observers regardless of their motion or the motion of the source. It's the one true universal constant, the speed of light. Now, the special relativity concepts that we'll be looking at. Number one, we need to be able to describe and calculate proper time and dilated time. Number two, we also need to be able to describe and calculate proper length and contracted length. Number three, there's mass energy calculations where we have to understand the concepts of rest energy and kinetic energy. And finally, number four, the fusion production of energy in the sun. These are the four main concepts that the VCAA study design expects students to understand at the unit three level. For those questions that are quantitative and require calculations, we have the following VCAA formulas as well. And so we have the equation for Lorentz's factor, which is very important in many of the calculations we perform. The time dilation, length contraction, rest energy, relativistic total energy, relativistic kinetic energy, and the speed of light as a constant in a vacuum. We'll use all of these in the following questions. Our first question comes from the 2019 exam, VCAA, and it is as follows. Joanna is an observer in Spaceship A, watching Spaceship B fly past at a relative speed of 0.943, the speed of light. That is a gamma or a Lorentz factor of three. She measures the length of the spaceship B from her frame of reference to be 150 meters. Which of the following is closest to the proper length of spaceship B? As Joanna is in the frame of reference of spaceship A, we can see her there in a frame watching and observing. She notices that there will be a length contraction of the object that's moving fast past her relative to her observational frame of reference. So it contracts and moves past. So the question is, which one of the following is closest to the proper length of spaceship B? So it's important to note, first of all, she measures the length of spaceship B from her frame of reference to be 150 meters. She's observing the spaceship B moving quickly past her. So that is a contracted length of 150 meters. She's trying to work out what is the proper length. That would be the length measured on spaceship B. And of course, we have a Lorentz factor or a gamma factor of three. The equation that relates these two variables is the contracted length is equal to the proper length divided by gamma. We can then express that as the proper length equals the contracted length multiplied by gamma. Let's substitute our values in. The contracted length was 150 meters with a gamma factor of three. So multiplying them together, we find the proper length that measured on spaceship B would be 450 meters. So that is option C. The next question comes from 2018, it's question 13, multi-choice, and is as follows. Which of the following diagrams best represents the value of gamma, the Lorentz factor, versus speed for an electron that is accelerated from rest near the speed of light? Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four graphs, one of which is correct. First of all, here's our equation for gamma, the Lorentz factor. So this is a common equation that's used a lot in VCA physics. And it's equal to one over the square root of one take the speed of the object squared divided by the speed of light squared. When the speed of the object is zero, if we substitute in the value of zero, we find gamma ends up, well, zero divided by anything is zero. One take zero is one. So gamma is one over root one, which is just one. So we can check which of the graphs has a gamma of one when its speed is zero. We can inspect these straight away and see which ones do or do not uphold this condition. Or an easy way of looking at this is we're looking for a graph that has a coordinate of 
speed of zero and gamma of one, an x value of zero and a y value of one. So let's check this out as a starting point. There's a zero one, not on that graph. So that rules out option A. There's a zero speed and potentially a gamma of one, that's possible. This has got a speed of zero and a gamma of minus one. Now all of us know that there's no such thing as a negative Lorentz fact, that option's failed. And finally D, this shows a speed of zero and a gamma of potentially one as well. So these two options are both viable. Let's further investigate this. We know, however, that an object increasing its speed will approach this speed of light limit as an asymptote. So the graph should be asymptotic, as is the case with graph D here. It approaches but never reaches the speed of light. Whereas this graph is a straight linear association that goes straight to an intercept along here of the speed of light reference line. So unfortunately, B is not an option as well. So that gives option D is the only possible graph that has a positive Lorentz factor at an initial speed of zero and approaches but never actually reaches the speed of light. Next question, which of the following statements about kinetic energy of a proton traveling at relativistic speeds is the most accurate? So is it A, the difference between the proton's relativistic kinetic energy and its classical kinetic energy cannot be determined? B, the proton's relativistic kinetic energy is greater than its classical kinetic energy? C, the proton's relativistic kinetic energy is the same as its classical kinetic energy? Or D, the proton's relativistic kinetic energy is less than its classical kinetic energy? Now many of you all know this straight away by definition, but I thought I'd approach this from an example angle. Let's consider a proton's kinetic energy at a relativistic speed of about 0.942 the speed of light, which gives us a gamma of three. Classical kinetic energy, E k equals a half mv squared. So we substitute in the mass of a proton and its speed, the fraction of the speed of light, all squared. That gives us a kinetic energy of 6.68 by 10 to the negative 11 joules. Of course, this is a small amount because the mass of the proton is very, very small. If we look at this at the relativistic approach for kinetic energy, we use the following equation. So we substitute in a gamma of three. The mass remains the same, 1.67 by 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And now we're multiplying by the speed of light squared, 3.0 by 10 to the eight squared. We do our calculations. That gives us a relativistic kinetic energy of 3.01 by 10 to the negative 10 joules, which in fact is larger than that of the classical. So we can find out that B, the proton's relativistic kinetic energy is greater than its classical kinetic energy. So the option we take is B. Our next question, Yani is stationary in a spaceship traveling at a constant speed. Does this mean that the spaceship must be in an inertial frame of reference? Justify your answer. A good question, this one. Probably trips up a lot of students. Yani's spaceship could be traveling in a constant speed in two ways. First of all, it could be in a straight line. In which case, constant speed would also be the same as constant velocity. In this scenario, the spaceship would be in an inertial frame of reference because there's a constant velocity occurring. However, there's a second option, that is Yani is in a circular path. In which case, the spaceship is accelerating in a circular orbit. Whilst its speed can remain constant as it travels around the circular orbit, it is accelerating towards the center, as all circular motion does. In this case, the spaceship would not be in an inertial frame of reference because it's accelerating. So to say it must be in an inertial frame of reference would be incorrect. So no, the spaceship is not necessarily in an inertial frame of reference, or we cannot say it must be in an inertial frame of reference. It could be moving in a circular orbit, thereby undergoing acceleration. If this were the case, the spaceship would not be in an inertial frame of reference. Question 15 from 2018 exam. A stationary scientist in an inertial frame of reference observes the spaceship moving past her at a constant velocity. She notices that the clock on the spaceship, which are operating normally, run eight times slower than her clocks, which are also operating normally. The spaceship has a mass of 10,000 kilograms. And we're asked to calculate the kinetic energy of the spaceship in the scientist's frame of reference. Show your workings. So first of all, ship goes past our stationary scientist in an inertial frame of reference. So we're told that the clock runs eight times slower. So for a moving clock to run slower, it's by a factor of the Lorentz factor. So it's traveling eight times slower. We know that gamma, the Lorentz factor must be eight. Time never speeds up due to special relativity, it only slows down. So it's eight times slower, gamma is eight. The mass we know to be 10,000 kilograms. And we're asked to calculate the kinetic energy. Here's our equation. Kinetic energy, the relativistic kinetic energy is in brackets, gamma, the Lorentz factor, subtracting one 
multiplied by the mass and the speed of light squared. Let's put our values in gamma of 8, mass of 10,000, and the speed of light is 3 by 10 to the 8 squared. When we do that calculation, we come out with a relativistic kinetic energy of this ship of 6.3 by 10 to the 21 joules. Our next question. Quasars are among the most distant and bright objects in the universe. One quasar, 3C446, has a brightness that changes rapidly with time. Scientists observe the quasar's brightness over a 20-hour time interval in Earth's frame of reference. So here's how scientists are observing an initial frame of reference with the Earth. The quasar is moving away from Earth at a speed of 0.704, the speed of light, which gives us a gamma or a Lorentz factor of 1.41. We're asked to calculate the time interval that would be observed in the quasar's frame of reference. Show your workings. So we know, first of all, there's a gamma or a Lorentz factor of 1.41. We know that from the Earth's reference and the scientist's initial frame of reference, there is 20 hour time interval being measured. And we're being asked to calculate the time interval that would be observed in the quasar's frame of reference. That's the proper time of the moving object. Our dilated time is equal to the Lorentz factor, gamma, multiplied by the proper time. We can transpose that and it gives us that the proper time is equal to the dilated time divided by gamma. Sub our values in, the dilated time was 20 hours and our Lorentz factor is 1.41. Divide those through and we end up with a proper time in the frame of reference of the quasar of 14.2 hours. Next question, question 10 multi-choice in the 2017 exam. A student sits inside a windowless box that has been placed on a smooth riding train carriage. He conducts a series of motion experiments to investigate frames of reference. Which one of the following observations is correct? A, the results when the train accelerates are identical to the results when the train is at rest. That does not sound good. In terms of results being identical only occurs in inertial frame of reference, not when the train accelerates. B, the results when the train accelerates differ from the results when the train is in uniform motion in a straight line. It's possible. C, the results when the train is at rest differ from the results when the train is in uniform motion in a straight line. And D, the results when the train accelerates are identical to the results when the train is in uniform motion in a straight line. So Einstein's first postulate from his theory of special relativity states, the law of physics are the same in all inertial or non-accelerated frames of reference, which means they're different when you put them in different frames of reference. Or, the results in an accelerating frame of reference will be different to results in a uniform frame of reference. So our correct answer is B. The results when the train accelerates will differ from the results when the train is in a uniform motion in a straight line. Question 11, multi-choice from 2017. On average, the sun emits 3.8 by 10 to the 26 joules of energy every second. Just think about that. That's a colossal amount of energy every second in the form of electromagnetic radiation, which originates from the nuclear fusion reaction taking place in the sun's core. The corresponding loss in the sun's mass every second would be closest to. So the amount of energy the sun emits, E, equals 3.8 by 10 to the 26 joules. We're trying to work out what are the mass that it's losing, M. And of course, we need the speed of light, which is 3.0 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. Our equation is E equals mc squared. This is to do with the nuclear fusion of mass being lost in the sun and being converted into energy. We rearrange our equation. So we find m the subject. m is equal to E over c squared. Now we substitute in our values. The energy was 3.8 by 10 to the 26 joules. And the speed of light, as we know, is 3.0 by 10 to the 8. And of course, we have to square that denominator. That gives us a value of 4.2 by 10 to the 9 kilograms. Every second our sun is converting 4.2 by 10 to the 9 kilograms of matter into energy. That is phenomenal. Option B. Question 10, short answer from 2017. The length of a spaceship is measured to be exactly one third of its rest length as it passes by an observing station. What's the speed of this spaceship as determined by the observing station expressed as a multiple of c? So here's our scientist observing in an inertial frame of reference. This is the rest length of this ship, but as it's traveling past, it becomes one third of its length due to relativistic effects. So it shoots past and it's got length contraction occurring. So if the length of the ship is one third of its rest length, the Lorentz factor gamma must be three. Now it's velocity that it says calculate the speed as it travels past. Here's our equation for the Lorentz factor. Gamma equals one over the square root of one take v squared over c squared. 
and we're trying to find out for a gamma of 3, what value do we have for V? All right, so we substitute in our 3. Now we multiply the bottom of our fraction, the denominator across, and then divide 3 across, effectively swap these two in position, we have our new expression. If we then squared both sides, we'd get rid of the square root, and the 1 on 3 becomes 1 on 9. Now it's a case of adding the V squared on C squared to the right, and then subtracting the 1 on 9 to the left. And that gives us a V squared on C squared, 1 take 1 on 9 gives me 8 on 9. If I took the common factor of squares out of this fraction, and then took the square root of both sides, I can see that V over C is the square root of 8 on 9. Finally, if I multiply the C across, I know the speed of this spaceship must be root 8, 9 times C, or 0.943C. There's our answer. Now that includes all the derivations, the long way of doing it. Let me show you a shorter way. Here's the transposed equation for the Lorentz factor making the velocity of the subject. Now I simply sub in the Lorentz factor of 3, I square that number, becomes 1 take 1 on 9, 1 take 1 on 9 becomes 8 on 9, and it's still all square rooted, and I get exactly the same answer in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 steps. Question 11a, short answer from the 2017 exam. Tests of relativistic time dilation have been made by observing the decay of short-lived particles. A muon travelling from the edge of the atmosphere to the surface of the Earth is an example of such a particle. To model this in the laboratory, another elementary particle with a shorter half-life is produced in a particle accelerator. It is travelling at 0.99875 the speed of light, with a gamma of 20. Scientists observe that this particle travels 9.14 by 10 to the negative 5 meters in a straight line from the point where it was made to the point where it decays into another particle. It is not accelerating. A. Calculate the lifetime of the particle in the scientist's frame of reference. So here's our scientist in the frame of reference observing our particle as it moves from one side of the accelerator to the other. So calculate the lifetime in the scientist's frame of reference. So you want to know what is the time. The scientists observe the distance to be 9.14 by 10 to the negative 5 meters. And the speed it was traveling at was 0.99875 times the speed of light. So all these variables are already in the scientist's inertial frame of reference. So to work out the time, we start with speed equals distance over time, the traditional average speed equation. We transpose that and make t the subject, multiplying the denominator and dividing through by speed, and simply sub in our values. So time equals the distance of 9.14 by 10 to the negative 5 divided by 0.99875 of the speed of light, which is 3.0 by 10 to the 8. So that tells me this particular particle would exist for 3.05 by 10 to the negative 13 seconds. The second part was to calculate the distance of the particle traveling in the lab as measured in the particle's frame of reference. Note, in the particle's frame of reference, the laboratory is moving away with a gamma of 20, not the other way around. The distance traveled by the laboratory will be contracted by a factor of 20. So from the particle, we want to work out what is the contracted length that has been moved in the laboratory. So the proper length that is measured in the particle's frame of reference was 9.14 by 10 to the negative 5, and with a gamma of 20, a Lorentz factor of 20. So our equation here for the length contraction is the contracted length is equal to the proper length divided by gamma. So we sub our values in. The proper length was 9.14 by 10 to the negative 5 meters. The gamma is 20. When I divide through, that gives me a contracted length from the particle's perspective of the laboratory as 4.57 by 10 to the negative 6 meters. Part C. Explain why the scientists would observe more particles at the end of the laboratory measuring range than classical physics would expect. This is a three-point response. In the laboratory's frame, the particle's lifetime is increased because it is moving relative to the laboratory frame. Point two, the increased lifetime is called time dilation. And point three, this time dilation means that the moving particles travel further along the laboratory range before they decay than would be predicted from classical physics, which assumes that the half-life is the same in all frames of reference. Thank you for watching this video. I certainly hope that the examples presented today give you a little more confidence in special relativity. It can be a challenging concept, but practice makes perfect. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share and comment and to subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.